Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with talented jazz trumpeter and educator Clay Jenkins. From Lubbock, Texas, Clay has gone on to see the world and jam with some of the biggest names in jazz. He got his first real break with the Stan Kenton Orchestra, then moved on to Los Angeles and got involved with the big bands of Harry James, Buddy Rich, and finally the great Count Basie Orchestra. In August of 2015, he came out to Kansas City to get involved with the Charlie Parker birthday celebrations citywide going down and had some impressive words for the KC scene, along with much, much more. Please dig this interview, my friends. Hey, how are you? Hey, man, good. How are you? Good, good, good. Let me, let me go ahead and dive in here. Okay. And I know my, my general first question is what's been going on lately, but I know that you did have a fruitful trip here to Kansas City. So talk to me a little bit about how it came about and what went on while you were here. Uh, you know, I've known a lot of guys in Kansas City through the years, uh, especially Bob Bowman and Danny Embry. Yeah. And then I, I got to know Gerald Dunn, who's a... Do you know Gerald? Yes. And and he's just a lovely guy. And so uh, and I also was on the road with... Uh, on the Kenton Band with a guy named Jay Sullenberger, who's a, a trumpet player there in Kansas City also. So I've known uh, he and his wife for a long time, so... Um, and I was in school with Bob Bowman. Do you know Bob Bowman? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So he and I were fast friends, and he lived in Los Angeles for about 10 years while I did. So we, I had played with him uh, at City Lights and things like that. So, And I'd done some um, jazz camps at UMKC. And I'd been in Kansas City a lot, and so this came up. I think they had somebody else lined up, and that fell through. So Gerald Dunn called Bob and... And uh, I got to do it, so it was really, I was really thrilled. It was really fun. Yeah, cool. So the whole endearing spirit of Charlie Parker is not indelibly alive with the week-long celebration. What was it like? I did actually catch you on stage at the Majestic with Herman and Stan. What was it like to be a part of that playing music, celebrating his life? Well, the town was just so uh, abuzz with him, you know, and there, there was busts and statues and plaques and people... I, and I went to Lincoln High School, where he went to high school, and I played a, I did a workshop there, and they, all the kids knew who he was, and you know, they they knew that the, they knew the uh, legacy of their school. So it seems like his, his, there's a certain spirit that's in the town. It's always been a real crossroads kind of north and south, and east and west, and a lot of bands. When I was on the road with Basie and Stan Kenton and Buddy Rich, we, we'd go through Kansas City all the time, and it, yeah. and it seemed like it's just always kind of kept its heritage as a good jazz town. For a long time, I think it was more of a blues town. Yeah. But it's become more of a jazz town again, it seems like. And, uh, you know, not that it's not a blues town. It's a great blues town. But just having that that lineage of, of Charlie Parker being born there and being buried there and he played there a lot, I think that's just uh, something that the town really takes pride in. They have the display of his horn, or one of its horns at the jazz museum. It's a great. It's a really good jazz town. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's gotten a lot better with Bobby Watson at UMKC. There's a real fervor. There's a lot of young blood coming up on the street. Oh streets, yeah. So. Yeah. In fact, there were a lot of really great players from St. Louis. And you know, it's, it's it's there's more playing going on in in Kansas City than just about any town I can think of. I played in like twelve or fourteen different places yeah. while I was there, and all the players were really good. And yeah, especially right the rhythm section guys, you know. That's cool. Yeah, I think that this town is definitely going through a renaissance as far as the jazz is concerned, for sure. Oh, yeah, it's great, you know. Yeah. So a lot of young guys are moving there, and then they're going to New York and playing, and then they, they, but they want to live in Kansas City because they're getting a play so much, which is really cool, you know. There's a drummer, Matt Kane, out in New York, and he uh, he came back here and assembled a, a kind of a super group with all of these guys that have really hit the scene hard, and he's been coming back here. So it's 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 fun to see a pilgrimage of cats from New York and around the country wanting to come through and get kind of that fervor of KC jazz that's going down now. So. Yeah, it's really cool. I, I had a, I had, a, I mean, every day was so fun. I, I'd do a workshop or something during the day, and then I'd play in like three different places. And i got to say, everybody treated me so amazingly nicely, you know. And it was just really ten days of jo uh, joyful days, you know. And I was busy. I was busy. They, they, they knew I had a lot of energy. I do have a lot of energy, but they, they found out and 
they <laughs> kept me busy. You know? So let me kind of go back to the lineage of your life. Where were you born and raised? I grew up in uh, Lubbock, Texas. What was it about Lubbock that gave you a lot of jazz? Really, not much. My dad was a player, but he, you know, he was he was more of a, an older style, like Dixie kind of swing player, and um, yeah. and he had some friends that were good players, and then. He, t- he and my mom taught at Texas Tech, not in the music department, but the Texas Tech Jazz. For Lubbock, Texas, there were there were a few really good players. There was a guy there named Don Caldwell who was a, a really good saxophone player. So I was around some good players. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I went over to North Texas, which was a rude awakening, you know, because I was pretty good for Lubbock, Texas, but I wasn't as good as the guys at North Texas. So, <laughs> so I kind of had to start, you know start at the bottom, which I did. So I was there for four years, and then just as I finished up school, I went on on the road with Stan Kenton, which was really a blessing. That was a real learning experience, and that's where I was with Jay Sullenberger, and I was out on that band for two years, and then I moved to Los Angeles, and then from Los Angeles, I went on the road briefly with Harry James, which I really, it wasn't my cup of tea, but then I, I went out with Buddy Rich's band, for a couple of tours, and then I did uh, Count Basie's band for about nine months. So that was after Basie had died, and then I was sort of—I I was a charter member of the Clayton Hamilton band. So I, I still do that. I've been on that band for 30 years, 25 of which were with uh, Snooky Young. Okay, so that, that was pretty amazing. So that was a great education. As well, yeah. So, but in the very beginning, to be with Stan Kenton's outfit, that had to be a huge um, leap for you. It was, and I, I don't know that I was really quite ready because I was taking a, a really great trumpet player. His, name, his name's Tim Hagens, and and uh, those were his were big shoes to fill. And I and I uh, Stan was real patient, you know. But uh, I mean, I was okay for a college kid. I was okay, but I, you know, I had a lot of learning to do, and I still do. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, yeah, it was great. It was, it's a real trumpet player's band. It was. I loved it before I did it. I always loved Stan Ken's band. My dad liked Stan Ken's band. It was pretty majestic, you know, sort of like Wagnerian jazz, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, he was he was great. Stan was really great to us. So along with the music, as you mentioned, you've been on stage with a lot of luminaries and big shots and jazz. You're also an associate professor of jazz trumpet at the Eastman School. I'm actually a, a full professor now. Full, okay, all right. Okay, cool. So as a professor, I want to ask you this. What is your teaching philosophy with the kids? I mean, when I came to Eastman, it was a, that was a kind of a rude awakening, too, because uh, these kids really expect you to be ready, and and, uh, and uh, the play, the level here is really high. So my, I've, I'm kind of getting this insight that I have them really strive for, uh, I, I harp on it a lot, but I really strive for depth, of musicality in every aspect of their musicianship. So whether it be harmony or tune knowledge or knowledge of the history of the players or sound or anything, I, I, I want them to go for depth because I, I believe that that, that gives, them, uh, gives all of us more options, at, which gives us more choices. So uh, when I finally kind of adopted this approach, they stopped uh, wondering why we were working on stuff because it was all for depth, and, and it all uh, adds up to them having more choices as players, which is a great thing, you know, because it kind of equates to freedom, you know. So yeah. it's uh, it's worked well for me, because I, I have them work on real old stuff and new stuff, and, and I tell them I don't want them, I mean, we study, you know, we study everyone from, uh, everyone from uh, Louis Armstrong to, the, the guys that are still playing now, and I tell them I don't want them to sound like the guys. I just want to have those guys in there playing. Yeah. So, so uh, I've just uh, it's it's been real good for everybody, I think, and and myself included. So, who has taught you the most in your life? I've been really lucky. I've had really good trumpet teachers. You know, just like trumpet. I had a really good trumpet teacher in uh, my hometown, and my dad taught me a lot, and uh, my my older brother. In his own way, he taught me a lot. He played trumpet too. He was actually a good player. Cool. And uh, and then being in the bands, especially with Snooky Young, um, I mean, you can't sit next to Snooky Young for 25 years and not learn a lot. So yeah. Um, and I and I also have had a great opportunity to play with some really great rhythm sections like like John Clayton and Jeff Hamilton and uh, 
a guy named Dennis McCrell and a guy named Steve Houghton who teaches in Indiana and uh I've got I've gotten a uh, Joe LaBarbera. I play in Joe LaBarbera's band and he's been a he's been a great teacher to me. He was you know, he was Bill Evans he was Bill Evans' last drummer. Oh, okay. So uh yeah, Joe's been sort of uh, a big brother figure to me and I've learned I've learned a lot about being a leader and about being a player from him. He's he's a really important guy to me. And uh, and some of the guys on, on uh, Stan Kenton's band that I'm still really good friends with, like Gary, Gary Hobbs, the drummer, and yeah. and uh, like I said, Jay Sullenberger. So a lot of the guys I was on the road with, and then guys I've worked for, I would say. But I'm learning, you know, I'm, I'm and I, I certainly learn a lot from my from my colleagues. I work with a, a guy named Harold Danko, who's a great piano player, a guy named Bill Dobbins, who's another great piano player here at Eastman, so it's it's like I'm it's like I'm a student here. It's really great. So let me ask you this. Um what's the greatest thing about waking up every day for you? Well, I've got uh four beautiful kids and a wonderful wife and uh I mean uh, my wife's in LA right now, so we're kinda living a commuting life. We're not, I wouldn't say we're apart but we're we're commuting. So mm-hmm. we're spending a lot of time apart, which is a drag. But I mean, I'm very thankful for my family, and and I just feel like uh, they keep me young, and uh, the music keeps me young because I'm still, I'm still trying to get better, and I'm still trying to be a better teacher, and I'm still yeah. trying to write, you know. Yeah. So it's uh, there's never a dull moment. This thing, I mean, that was such a thrill to be in Kansas City, and today I got a call to be an artist in residence in Australia for six weeks. I don't know if I'll be able to do it, but. Just little things like that, that that come up. Every day is fresh and new, and it keeps you healthy, I think. I mean, I'm 61, and I, I feel 22. You know? So let me ask you this. You've dedicated your, your life to the jazz craft. Why do you love jazz? <laughs> well, you know, I, I I knew when I was pretty young that I, I, I was going to be a pretty good trumpet I mean, I wanted to be a pretty good trumpet player. I, I I wanted to be a good shortstop, but I, wasn't, I was not good enough for that, you know. <laughs> and I thought I wanted to be a... A veterinarian, but I, I wasn't good at that either. So it was a little bit that by default I was better at being a trumpet player than those other things. But I really think I, I sort of leaned toward jazz, partly because my dad did it and he liked it and kind of introduced me to it. But also I studied classical trumpet and I just I wasn't very good at playing perfectly. You know, I'd make I'd, make, I'd get nervous and I'd make mistakes, and, and I wasn't a great studio player in Los Angeles, like playing movies and stuff. I was okay, but I wasn't that great. So. As a jazz musician, you do, you're not so so concerned with making mistakes. I mean, you you need to be accurate. And you need to be informed, but it's not a bad mark on you like a, like you would be if you were a principal oboist or something in a symphony. So I, I I sort of helped me free up a little bit, I think, you know. And uh, I found that I was a pretty good improviser. I I was a real ear player, and I was, I needed to be. I, I was pretty behind. Had a lot of catch. I still have a lot of catching up to do. I guess I was fairly natural at it, but I wasn't as natural. I mean, I was, but I wasn't as good as a lot of my peers in school. That's for sure. You know, I was, I, I was kind of a little bit more of a late bloomer than some, of my, some of my pals in school. This question is by by no means a swan song, but when you look back on your life, or you know, starting out with Stan Kenton and playing with cats like Kurt Elling and. Uh, Billy Childs and all these people you share the stage with. When you look back on your career, what do you want the jazz world to remember you for as far as your voice and your contribution and what you have given and dedicated your life to? I guess I would say, first of all, being a, being a good a good person, you know, uh, first and foremost, and a thoughtful person, um, which is way more important than being a, a good musician to me. But... Uh, in terms of being a musician, I guess I've kind of hung my head on trying to sound like myself with the lineage of the of the art form in my playing. Like I, I you know, it's important to me that I swing real hard. You know, it's not like I want to play so new that I uh, that I'm not swinging. So I, I want to sound like myself. I want to sound modern, but I I want to show respect to the lineage. So not, I don't want to play like those guys. I don't want to play, but I, I want to have them in my playing. That's great, and that's a great way to kind of sum things up. Thanks for opening up your world a little bit. My pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Clay. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Clay for his time, energy, coming to KC, and that tasty music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store or 
or you can visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things neon jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.